Performance USA, the greatest entertainers in America, as requested by you, the fighting men of the United States Armed Forces throughout the world. Command Performance, presented this week and every week, till it's over, over there. Okay there, mister, here comes that big show of yours, answering those letters to Command Performance, care of Special Service Division, Los Angeles, USA. So all of you in the AEF, come on home for a half hour with your favorite stars. And all of you in the United Nations, come along as the fighting guests of Johnny Doughboy and company. There's the curtain going up on our worldwide stage of command performance. And walking out for the downbeat, here comes the gal who's walked into the hearts of the whole AEF, that ever-loving Dinah Shore. Ken? Yeah, who's that playing, Dinah? Why, it's Gabriel, Gabriel playing, Gabriel, Gabriel saying, will you be ready to go when I blow my horn? Blow, Gabriel, blow, go on and blow, Gabriel, blow. I've been a sinner, I've been a scam, but now I'm willing to trim my lamp. So blow, Gabriel, blow. I was low, Gabriel, low. Mighty low, Gabriel, low. But now since I have seen the light, I'm good by day and I'm good by night. So blow, Gabriel, blow. Once I was headed below. Yes, I was headed below. But when I got to Satan's door, I heard you blowing on your horn once more. So I said, Satan, farewell. And now I'm all ready to fly. Yes, to fly higher and higher and higher. Cause I've gone through the brimstone and I've been to the fire. And I've hurt my soul and my heart. So climb up the mountaintop and start to blow, Gabriel, blow. Go on and blow, Gabriel, blow. I want to join your happy band and play all day in the promised land. So blow, Gabriel. Hiya, fellas. This is Dinah. Hey, what ever happened to what's his name? Uh, Mussolini? Uh, is it true that he's getting a civil service job in Berlin blowing hot air into old barrage balloons? <laughs> well, anyhow, let's talk about you. We dreamed up another 4 old command performance, and before they pry me loose from this microphone, I'm sending love to the Silver Dollar Gun Crew at Dutch Harbor, to Memphis Al Gilmore at 954... Dawson and the ACS gang, Bob and the company A Boys at 913, and to Moe's Mob at 520. Hi there, Culver City Jimmy Alsobrook, Tommy and Bob at 980, and Heidi Stonewall, Stone, I mean Stony Stonewall, that's right. Stinky Davis, Good Girl Williams, Wendy Quinn, Smokey Flyward, Sandy, Lightning, Apple Knocker, and the gang at 929. Our best of box 35 at Navy 128. And Don Herrick with the CBs in the South Pacific, Haverhill, Massachusetts, is plenty proud of you, Pappy. And by the way, I've caught myself quite a case on those engineers down where the skeeters buzz and the chiggers chug. How about that, Junior? Howdy, Al Sanders. Scribe for the tribe at 935. Well, somebody better turn me off, because I'm holding up one of the best bands in America. Fellas, here comes the music of good old Dr. Tommy Dorsey. <laughs> fellas. This is awful. All, all of Tommy's great band is here, but all of a sudden they hand me a telegram from Tommy that says, Dinah, this is a last minute thing and I sure hate to do it. My boys will be there tonight playing for the AEF, but I'll have to catch the show from a hospital cot. But don't worry, the gang will be in there beating it out. Oh, fellas, let's give old Tommy a hand. Thank you. 
Thanks, and get well in a hurry, Tommy Dorsey. Men, we've had a bushel of mail from the South Pacific, so here's the Tommy Dorsey Orchestra and the Sentimentalists answering those commands with Somebody Loves Me. Tommy Dorsey's band is going to do another tune in a shake. Meantime, we're buzzing Johnny Santos and the gang at 867 and Kansas Bill Wilmshire and colleagues at 953. How's everybody at 617, including Corporal Carl Carpenter, no relation to our boy Ken Carpenter, and uh, what's with Private Lawrence Weinman and the Mobile Medical Outfit at 251? Guess you and the Tommies are working on that new project by now. Howdy, Spina, McCormick, Ratcliffe, and McCallion at 29. Regards from Bing and Ann Sheridan to Reuben Kirsch at 634. Second Louis John Buffington in southwest Alaska. Stay contented there, lad. Newark is waiting for you. Love to Stump, Burrow, Tex, and Tinkers at AP041. Ditto to Deacon Cohen, Harpo Fitzpatrick, Commando Fortune, Pollock, Dutch Jungle, Swede, and the dirty first section of Battery V at 27. <laughs> Double ditto to Marconi, Bell, and Edison and the Walkie Squawky crew. And now the good word to all of you outside the USA is, let's get inside Benchley for one of his incomparable bedtime stories. Applause and play on for Robert Benchley. <laughs> Thank you, Miss Shaw. This is going to be a ghost story. <laughs> And for the purposes of its telling, I shall assume the voices of several characters, fooling no one, and uh, <laughs> making it more embarrassing for everyone. Tell us a ghost story, Uncle Edith, cried all the children late Christmas afternoon when everyone was cross and sweaty. <laughs> Very well, then, said Uncle Edith. This isn't much of a ghost story, but uh, if I hear any whispering while it's going on, I will seize the luckless offender and break his arm. <laughs> well, to begin, my father was a poor woodchopper, and we lived in a charcoal burner's hut in the middle of a large, dark forest. That's the beginning of a fairy story, you big sap, cried little Dolly. <laughs> little Dolly was a fat, disagreeable child who never should have been born. <laughs> What we wanted was a ghost story. To be sure, to be sure, cried Uncle Edith. What a stupid old whoopid I was. The ghost story begins as follows. It was late in November when my friend Warrington came up to me in the club one night and said, Craig, old man, I want you to come down to my place in Whoopshire for the weekend. 
There's gruffle shooting to be done and grouse no end. <laughs> what do you say? Well, I've been working hard that week and the prospect pleased. So it was that the 340 out of Charing Cross found Warrington and me on our way to Whoopshire, loaded down with guns, plenty of flints, and two of the most beautiful snootfuls ever accumulated in Merry England. <laughs> It was getting dark when we uh, reached Breaming Downs. And as we drove up the shadowy path to the door, I felt Warrington's hand on my knee. Cut that out, I said. <laughs> uh, look, he said, there's a shadow against the pane in the guest room window. Well, what of it, I asked. It was my turn to look astonished. Warrington lowered his voice. Whenever there is a shadow against the window pane as I drive up with a guest, that guest is found dead in bed the next morning, dead from fright, he added significantly. I looked up at the window toward which he was pointing. There, silhouetted against the glass, was the shadow of a gigantic man. I say man, it was more the figure of a large weasel. <laughs> Except for a fringe of dark red clappers that were more suspended from its beak. How do you know they were dark red, asked little Tom Kitt. If it was the only shadow that you saw. You shut your traps, at Uncle Edward. <laughs> I could hardly control my astonishment at the sight of this thing. It was so astonishing. <laughs> well, I said, I'm going up and beard Mr. Ghost in his den. So up the dark winding stairway we went into the resounding corridors of the old 17th century house, pausing only when we came to the door of what was to be my room. I knocked. There was a piercing scream from within as we pushed the door open. When we entered, we found the room empty, completely empty. Well, I guess it was nothing, said Warrington, cheerfully. Perhaps the wind and the trees. But the shadow and the pain, I asked. He pointed to a fancily carved piece of guest soap on the washstand. The light was behind that, he said. <laughs> and from the outside, it looked like a man. To be sure, to be sure, I said. <laughs> but I could see that Warrington was white as a sheet. Is there anything that you need, he asked. Breakfast is at nine, if you're lucky, he added jokingly. <laughs> I think I have everything I said. I'll do a little reading before I go to sleep and perhaps count my laundry. <laughs> How many people have died of fright in this room, I asked, thumbing through the pages of town and country. Seven in all, he said. I wonder if I might have a glass of hot water with my breakfast. I said, it warms your stomach. Doesn't it, though, he agreed. <laughs> <laughs> and was gone. I have to go to the bathroom, said little Roger, age six. <laughs> well, go ahead, said Uncle Edith. You know where it is. I don't want to go alone, whined Roger. <laughs> go with Roger, Arthur, commanded Uncle Edith. And whatever was the horrible thing in your room, Uncle Edith, asked all the children in unison when Roger and Arthur had left the room. I can't tell you that, replied Uncle Edith, for I packed my bag and got the 940 back to town. That is the lousiest ghost story I ever heard, <laughs> said, said Peter Ken. I'm glad you liked it, replied Uncle Edith, giving him a hot foot. <clears throat> so that is my ghost story. Next week, a story for just the boys, shall we? <laughs> Thank you, Robert Benchley. Well, gang, long about this time last year, Command Performance had a session compared, as they say in Britain and Australia, compared by Edward Arnold with Jack Benny and his fiddle, Yasha Heifetz and his fiddle, and a charming girl who made her Metropolitan debut not long before that memorable night. But why am I telling you guys about it? For ever since that evening, you've been knocking on our door, asking for another date with this magnificent voice. So tonight, it's our pleasure, along with yours, to say welcome back to Command Performance, Reza Stevens. <laughs> Thank you, and hello, fellows. Well, Dinah, I'm at your service. What are my orders? Oh, just send a bit of that heavenly Stevens voice to all the APO and FPO numbers, Reason. <laughs> and what do you think I ought to sing? Well, with the Brothers Dorsey little combo on duty, as well as the Command Performance Orchestra, we could back you up on anything from the 
Rondo Capricioso to Minnie from Trinidad. Oh. <laughs> I think I'd better steer more of a middle course. Okay, Reza, but before you set sail, I know some GI characters here and there who'd love to hear from you personally. All right, Donna. And I'll take just a moment to send a greeting to Corporal Russ Irwin and the Engineer Depot at 961 and to Sniffles Dodd down there at Fort Sherman. And I'd especially like to say cheerio and chin up to the sister of Ada Ellis over there in Portsmouth. My dear, every gold star mother in America sends you her love and sympathy. And for the many hundreds of you Marines and Doughboys from Samoa to Sicily, and for all of Uncle Sam's fighting men and women on planet Earth, Here's one of your great favorites. I'll see you again from Bittersweet. Stephen. Fellas, as I told you earlier in the show, Tommy Dorsey's orchestra is here tonight, but old Tommy's gone and gotten himself stuck away in a sick bed. Tommy had a little correspondence to hang out on the overseas line, so I'll have to do it for him. Hello there, McMahon, King, and the Zero Busters. Howdy, Kentucky Bob and Pennsylvania Junie with the H&S Battery, FPO San Francisco. From way out there on the Pacific, Leathernex Harry, Larry, and Steve tell us they missed the Hollywood Canteen on Saturday night. Say, we know you three have cats from the Palladium. Greeting to Stevens and uh, at 989 and to you guys who wrote and said, uh, dedicate a tune to a certain sergeant in the MPs, dearly beloved. <laughs> <laughs> Good luck to our Red Cross gals at 915 and elsewhere. To Jess Whitworth in Auckland, Margarita McManus in Glasgow, and Pete at APO number one. 
Corporal Nils Hansen and the PFC Bud Mason in the South Pacific. Hello to all of you and goodbye to the Nazis in Sicily. Now, boys, uh, go to work and do old Pappy Dorsey real proud. Dorothy and all 26 in your great organization. Now for all you guys and gals who write those swell letters and make us feel so darn good about our work on command performance, I've got a piece of business here you've never heard before. It's a song Frankie Lester and Arthur Schwartz scribbled for a Warner Brothers flicker called Thank You Lucky Star. The picture hasn't even been released yet, but we smuggled a tune out, figuring maybe we could sell you a part interest in it. And we thought you'd kind of like to know that you've nothing to worry about so far as Scouts are coma concerned because they're either too young or too old. You marched away and left this town as empty as can be. I can't sit under the apple tree with anyone else but me. For there is no secret lover. That the draft board didn't discover They're either too young or too old They're either too gray or too grassy green The pickings is poor and the crop is lean What good is in the army, what's left will never harm me They're either too old or too young So darling, you'll never get stung Tomorrow I go hiking with that Eagle Scout unless I get a call from Grandpa for a snappy game of chess. I'm finding it easy to say good as gold. They're either too young or too old. They're either too warm or too cold. They're either too fast or too fast asleep. So darling, believe me, I'm yours to see. There isn't any gravy, the gravy's in the Navy. They're either too fresh or too stale. There is no available mail. 
I will confess to one romance I'm sure you will allow. He tries to serenade me, but his voice is changing now. I'm finding it easy to say good is good. They're either too young or too old. They're either too bald or too bold. I'm down to the wheelchair and bassinet. My heart just refuses to get upset. I simply can't comply to with no marine to tell it to. I'm either their first breath of spring or else I'm their last little fling. I either get a fossil or an adolescent pup. I either have to hold him off or help to hold him up. The battle is on, but the fortress will hold. They're either too young or too old. I'll never, never fail you when you are in Australia or up in the Aleutians or up among the Russians or flying over Egypt. Your heart will never feed you. And when you get to India, I'll still be what I've been to you. I've looked the field over and lo and behold, they're either too young or too old. Well, fellas, here comes that part of command performance we never liked, saying goodnight. You know, a girl can sort of imagine you guys snapping off the radio and maybe just sitting there for a couple of seconds. Then somebody says, well, what are you monkeys sitting there for? Anybody got a match? Who's got the dice? You're in a thousand different places. Somewhere you go back to digging a gun emplacement, fixing a half track, or you pull on your boots and make ready for patrol duty. Somewhere else, a few of you roll over in your bunks to catch a few hours of sleep. And through the barracks walls, you hear the hum of fighter planes, mixed in with the roar of the big boys, taking off for Rabaul or Kiska or Italy or Germany. An army cook goes back to the kitchen, a sailor back to cleaning a gun. A coast guardman takes over on the night watch, and a nurse may get up, get some writing paper for a marine. That's the way it goes, and that's the way it'll go until the big job is done. And fellas, it's mighty nice of you to make us feel we're a little part of that job. This is Dinah sending love and kisses from the USA and saying so long, gang. This is Ken Carpenter adding a line that command performance is arranged in cooperation with the Hollywood Victory Committee and produced for you men and women of the Armed Forces of the United Nations by the Special Service Division of the War Department of the United States of America.